Fall 2008 Adult Program Series opens tonight with Dress Up Your Dinner. Chef Katie Thomas is here to help you make your fall or holiday meal a feast for both the taste buds and the eyes. You'll learn some tricks for planning a pleasing menu, adding garnishes, and artfully presenting a meal from appetizer to dessert. Chef Kate is a certified executive pastry chef who has taught on the Black Hawk Technical College faculty for 18 years. She has worked as both a chef and a pastry chef. Programs in this series are supported by the Nancy B. Parker Endowment Fund. Pick up the complete brochure to find out what other interesting subjects you can delve into this fall. And now please welcome Chef Kate. Rush ahead to Thanksgiving. How's that sound? <laughs> well, I'm here tonight to show you a few little things uh, that you could probably incorporate into your meal. I know Thanksgiving is one meal where usually everybody's got to have exactly the sweet potatoes with marshmallows on top and everything else to go with it. So I'm just going to give you little ideas that you can do for um, courses. We also mentioned that it would be for four courses this evening. So we're going to do a little twist on those courses if that's all right. Um, does everybody have a recipe? So you can kind of follow along. Also, on the back, I put a little spot for notes, but you can scribble all over this thing if there's any little hints or things that you um, might find along the way. I'd like to take questions at the end if that's all right, and also give a little taste of what we're going to have tonight. Okay. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is the first course, which usually in a menu you always have an appetizer. So I did a little twist on the appetizer and I mixed it in with the soup. A lot of time when you have Thanksgiving dinner, too many courses means too much food to eat. By the time you get the turkey, you're way too full. So I've kind of combined courses together tonight. So I've done an appetizer soup. And I've married a few things together. And then also, rather than Cutting a soup bowl or a lot of soup, but you do it in a, in a coffee cup, tea cup, also in a shot glass, so that you get a little taste, a little flavor. And an appetizer is usually something to wake up your taste buds. So that's kind of what we have here tonight. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of ramaki before. It's usually a scallop wrapped in bacon. Well, instead I brought the holidays in, so I have bacon wrapped dates. So that's what I have for to start our appetizer out with. So they're smoky and they're sweet, you know, so that you get your saliva rolling for getting on with the meal. Um, let's see here. Hopefully this is really hot now. Close it up right again so that when you taste it, it'll stay warm. So we're going to put the soup in the cup. And what I've made for soup this evening is a roasted sweet pepper and tomato soup. So you don't have to give a large serving, but something to get the meal beginning. So this is very flavorful and it has kind of fall colors. So that's kind of nice. A lot of times people do like maybe a um, squash bisque or something like that. And I know there's sometimes there's a lot of people that, you know, some like it and some don't. But I thought tomato soup is kind of a thing that everybody enjoys, so that's why I chose that. Also, when we're doing up soups and appetizers and things like that, if you can just introduce a few little fresh herbs or anything, that's going to certainly make your dishes certainly seem a little more inviting. I'm not going to plate that one. I'm just going to show you how to do that. What I have in here also for a garnish, this is sour cream and heavy cream that's mixed together and just enough to make it so that you can work with it. If you notice, the soup is very thick, so it will float whatever you garnish on top, whether it's herbs or if it's like the sour cream and heavy cream garnish for this. And so what we're going to do, a decorative way for the soup, I apologize to people who are sleeping here, too fixed later, is we're gonna take this and we're gonna just do like a little spiral all inside the cup. And I'm going to take it and draw with a toothpick, do kind of like a little spider web. So I'm sure you've seen that done before. But it makes it nice and decorative. Just put that right there. This also adds great flavor to your soup. So I'm sure you've had cream of tomato soup before. Now we add a little cream to it. That's just going to when it hits your nose, it's going to be a little creamier. And also gives great eye appeal for that. Also, don't forget the herbs 
We always call these at school a non-functional garnish, but it is edible. But it really pops the color whenever you have a little something brown or rusty on the plate. So this is our appetizer and soup. That's our first course. So, and then you can exchange this with a cup. Maybe add some more appetizers to that. How many of you? Go ahead. Yep, you'd want it something they could drink. Unless you had maybe a demi toss or something like that. But a little shot glass is a really good way to just a little bit of soup. It doesn't take a lot of effort. You could make the soup way ahead of time. You could freeze it, whatever you want to, and then you just have to pop it either in the microwave or warm it up really quick. So that's really easy. And also, if you notice, I have it in a thermal pot, so you can make that ahead however long your thermal pot works. This has been in here since 4 o'clock this afternoon. So this mm -hmm. is just remember to heat this with hot water before you use it. So what you're doing is a little different in your meals. Maybe in your family you have certain little things that you have around the table. I'm going to go into salad now. My family likes deviled eggs, and they only seem to pop up on its holidays. And I know it sounds like a simple thing, but it's something everybody likes. So we're going to do a combination then. And if there's any questions about the recipes later on, you can ask me also. They're, they're fairly simple. Hopefully you can go through the procedures easily. The next thing for a second course then, I've combined again an appetizer along with a salad. So, as I mentioned before, my family likes things like deviled eggs. We always have all the pickles you probably made through the summer, um, pickled beets and things like that. So I've kind of married a few things together that would go really well. So. We have these. So you can take your family's favorite little appetizers and kind of roll them into your salad. I have kind of a spicy double egg here, which they should be devilish because that's what they're called. Mm -hmm. So I apologize to if you just want to make sulfur steaks up there. Mm -hmm. So what I've done through the creation of this salad is I've taken the beets, and I've used the juice to make a salad dressing. So, um, I don't know whether you like beets or not, but this dressing isn't very earthy or it doesn't really taste a lot like pickled beets, believe it or not. By the time you add the Dijon and mustard, and I also add a little honey to this one, so that's a little bit of a change I have in the recipe. So, always tweak things with your recipes. Always find new things. So I have a mixture of greens, which the darker the better for you. I'm not here to teach you nutrition, but that's really a nice thing to add. But you see how beautiful that color is? Mm -hmm. And it smells so good. I won't pass it around for you to get a little oil on your clothes or something. You don't want that. See, I have a small tongue. So you can either dress it yourself or put the dressing on the table if you'd like to. I know this seems maybe more work than you might want to do as far as your family. You can certainly take all these plated things and turn around and let it be family style. But it's always kind of nice maybe to take one course that you do in the kitchen and take it out to your family. It makes them feel special. And then maybe the rest of the will be family style. So slowly introduce them into these eyeful things that you want to eat. So there is our greens dressed with a beet vinaigrette. We have the dove of the eggs. Use my tongs again. And then I have the pickled beets to go along with it. So you just you know, dove them in again. You can use your own. What's that? Oh, your beets are going to Yes, we make everything in so Our homemade pickles. The other thing I have, I think in your recipe, I put down um, Swiss cheese. And so. Again, I was thinking fall colors, so I have a nice beach cheddar here from Wisconsin. I just want to mention, too, right now at Blackhawk Tech, we're doing um, a farm to table uh, concept of we're trying to get homegrown vegetables in our area, even meats and maybe eggs and cheeses, things like that, that are within a 100 mile radius of um, Blackhawk Tech. And we're using that instead of trying to get things from the purveyor from California. And other countries stuff to the border, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to make it more locally grown things. 
just a little more healthy. So not necessarily organic, but definitely a little healthier. So it wouldn't be a salad without some cheese on it, as far as I'm concerned, for Wisconsin. Also, I like a little crunch. So I can't eat some pecans. And I'm going to pull these out probably for a few of the dishes I'm showing you today. I try not ever to repeat anything in a course, but I just want to give you some other ideas that you could do. So maybe some toasted almonds or things like that that would go with the sap. So we have a little creamy egg. We've got the sweet and sour of the pickles. And then we have the salad. So we're trying to wake everybody up in their mouth about tastes and things and also the colors. So this makes a great Christmas salad, not just for Thanksgiving, using the pickled beans. So this is our salad for this week. How's it look so far? Good? So there'll be samples after on, or later on to get all finished. So we just try some this. Okay. Next thing I want to move on to before I go on to our main entree, that would be the next page that would be coming up is doing maybe a little different family style type setting of things. And I've taken a spaghetti squash and for a second. And I use it for a vessel to put food in. So I don't know if you know what Hubbard squash is, but they can be gigantic. So you've got quite a variety of fall squashes or even a pumpkin you could use. So I've taken the spaghetti squash, I scrape the seeds out of it, turn it upside down, make sure it's on a grease baking sheet, and then I bake the squash until it's tender. And if I could flip this, I'd show you that I just took a little slice off the bottom, so you don't have to worry at your dinner table. Somebody's moving that around. Another way to prop it up, lettuce leaves, or if you see here, my little decorative fall leaves that we have. So how many have eaten uh, new potatoes creamed with peas? Okay. Well, I've made mashed potatoes with the cream in it, little cream cheese also, and then peas inside that. Again, that's just giving you color. That's all that's for. To be honest with you, I just kind of popped them on. <laughs> but I did want to mention about peas, too. Don't use canned things. Try to aim more for frozen or for fresh if you can. Certainly much brighter in color and better for you. The also the thing with peas, I never cook them. I always just take them out of the freezer, run a little water over them, and drain them. And then I add that because the hot potato gets these peas, and they're just the way you want them. They're nice and sweet. They have a little snap to them. So it's pretty tasty that way. The other thing is I've taken the top then, and I've stuffed it with squash. I mean, no, it is a squash. I stuffed it with um, stuffing. And I have a recipe for you in the stuffing. Put it in here. And that it starts at the beginning of the stuffed turkey breast. So that's the stuffing that I used here. This is pork sausage. You can use stuffing mix, or you can just use fresh breadcrumbs or anything like that when you have at home to make your stuffing. You, I'm sure you have your favorite dressing that you like to make anyways. My family is really hooked on having the sausage in. And also dried cranberries. That's another thing that my family really likes. So try uh, maybe some dried apricots if you want to. You can leave the meat out. You don't have to have it. Turn it into the sauce. It would be really great. The only one I found the store though, the other day was the sage pork sausage. So this is actually pork over that here. So you could use it as a vessel. Can you ladies see this? Is that all right? Okay. All right. So I had the squash, but you could use this as your dish, your serving dish if you want to. Or you could bake this off and then slice this for portions. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So then you're getting a little bit of vegetable and you're getting your stuffing. You're also getting a little meat in there. My children, by the way, rather eat this than the turkey. So we're all hooked on the sausage thing. So now we have a nice little sausage and bread stuffing and it's in the squash. Okay. This one's a little thin. This is much thicker that I use, but I just want to utilize the oil. Mm -hmm. Just take the seeds out. This one's a little thin though because it's, I just kind of took the top off the squash. So this then would be used on your dinner plate. So we're going to start on the dinner plate. This one will be a vegetable and stuffing. And I'm going to do two different types of entree plates for you today. And I'm not going to eat any of that. I'll just use it as is. And then when it comes time for you for tasting, I'll heat that up for you. Turkey. Okay. So 
that was one way of using the squash, besides using the squash as for like family style. I'm sure you could fit something like that in somewhere along your family. You don't want to scare everybody right off the bat. <laughs> you know, artsy food. I know what my family does when they get that. These here? Yes, these have been blanched, except for the yellow squash, because I have to make them last for you ladies, so that you can see them, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, just for purposes for tonight. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what I usually do is I either steam them, drop them in boiling water, take them back out, you know, get their color. I put them in ice water right away to stop the cooking process. And I keep that beautiful green. So if you're doing broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, I do the same thing. And then just when I need to heat them up for the meal, it takes maybe a couple of minutes and that's it. So it saves time. Also this vessel, what you could do with this, since these are blanched, or if you do your potatoes, Cover this with foil, pop it in the oven after you take the turkey out. You need to be slicing that turkey and getting your gravy going, but this just needs to heat, and then it's ready to serve. So, another time saver. I'm always looking for time savers. Sometimes I do. Uh, to be honest with you, I love putting asparagus in there and broth. So, I know I get a little afraid of the microwave. I just don't. Yeah. But you don't have to, you can still steam. I like it because I keep that beautiful green color, and it's quick. So, um, what did I keep? Yes. Even the yellow vegetables, so not just the green, even the green carrots, everything. Blanch. Yeah, then put them. Okay. Yep. I'll blanch these either in boiling water, mm -hmm. or I can actually blanch in the microwave if there's people that like it. So you could put a pie dish, put some carrots in there, a little bit of water, cover them up, put them in. I know they even came out of some commercial where there's uh, plastic bags where. Your vegetable steamer bags. You can make your own. Okay. After you get this just a little bit of a shape and a stir, I have sauce in there. When you're plating a meal up, the first thing I always try to do is get the sauce on the bottom of the plate. And the reason for that is you made this beautiful turkey. You want to bury it. You also want to keep the plate hot. And this is a good way to do that, is to put the sauce on the bottom of the plate. So I just take a little ladle. Take that out. I'm going to do that over on this side too so you guys can see that. And then I take the sauce over here and just go in the middle and bring that up. So that keeps everything nice and warm. So. And then I have turkey. And in your recipe that I gave you, I took a turkey and I deboned it. I took the breast off the turkey and butterfly it, that means to cut it and open it up so it's a big piece. See, there's two lobes on the turkey, the breast parts. Each one can make a roll like this. This is a very small turkey, by the way, that I have here. And what I've done with that is I open that piece of turkey up, put it between plastic wrap, this is the breast, and I pounded that out between plastic. Now I have this beautiful rectangle of pure white turkey meat. Okay. And then I made your, your pork and bread stuffing sausage mixture. Laid it on top of that rectangle, rolled it up jelly roll fashion, and I took the skin off the turkey, and I rolled that all around that turkey breast. So now you're not going to have dry turkey meat. And moist, tender, and this is protected. And I sear this in a skillet before I stick it in the oven. I get that nice, rich brown color, and it also develops flavor. Anytime you brown anything, you're going to get caramelization, and it's going to give you more flavor rather than a bland sauce later on. So what we're going to do for presentation for this one is we're going to cut this into slices about quarter an inch to half inch thick and you can kind of see the slices now how that stuffing has been put inside there. So I'm going to take that meat and let's see, I want that on this plate. I've got little plans for this. So you're going to lay your slices out that way. The vegetable I have for this plate is some of that spaghetti squash. This is a spaghetti squash, by the way. And what I have in here is the spaghetti squash. And I've also done a little bit of diced carrots and caramelized onion and a little chives. So this breaks up the flavor a little bit. By the way, this squash is delicious. I tried it the other day at school. And I don't think it needs butter or anything on it. It's just nice and buttery and beautiful. So this might be a little scary for some families to get going on to learn how. Anyway, so now we have another vegetable added to the plate. That's what I love about holidays. You start eating all of those vegetables. And so this plate here, 
crystal leaves turkey. Can we see this one? I don't even know that. Mm -hmm. Squash aside for a little bit. For this one, what I've done is just sliced off roasted turkey. I have a little bit of uh, thigh meat and a little bit of breast meat. And I'm going to do it again for presentation, doing it kind of like dominoes or little concentric circles. So it's all been sliced to the bias, and I just kind of nestle that right up there against the vegetables. Again, we're eating with our eyes. So you're going to get a little dark meat, you're going to get a little white meat. And, get this way. and also, we have the big eater, don't we? <laughs> so I needed something to lean on, is why I did this. But the reason I brought a leg to show you this evening, let me turn that right around so you can see it. You notice how bare that bone is? What I've done into that leg is, when it was raw, I took my knife, my carry knife, and went around and cut a little circle in that leg. Some of you might have heard this before. And what happens is, after it's being roasted, I can pull the tendons out. So you know how sometimes you don't want to eat the leg because all those tendons are in the bottom? What's that? That's a good trick. It is a good trick. What I really like about it, too, when we're in the cooking profession, we're always cleaning up the bones and making them look nice and white. And if you see this cleaned up really nicely, I didn't have to do anything to it. So where I turned around here, you know the gristle that's at the top of the leg here? That just fell right off after roasting the, the leg. So it looked very pretty. I have sage this evening that's fresh. And I'll give you a little trick that's really good, if you've got the extra time, is to pan fry this in a little oil. It permeates the air. And they're the most nicest thing to just crunch and eat on. I love fried sage. So you might want to try just that little trick. So we're going to plop that right there. Put that little sage in the middle. How's our plate look? Pretty? And you can turn around again. Now we don't even have potatoes on this yet. This is for the big eater we got going right here. I have two different types of potatoes that I did this evening. Um, I kind of taken liberty with the sweet potato and the mashed potato, and I did what we call a Duchess potato, so I gave you that recipe also. But I gave you a little signature thing on here, and I'm going to show you what I do. What I like to do is I like to give this a little base. Usually when you make like it's like a twice baked potato mixture is what I have on here. And I always mix a little bit of the russet potato, the white potato, or you can go in with my sweet potato because they're a moisture potato. So I do like two parts sweet potato, one part white mixed together so that they stay nice and warm together. But the little base that I want to show you, my little trick I came up with is this is Yukon Gold potato. I pan fry these. So now I can squirt my potato on there. They're so much easier to pick up and move them rather than trying to pick up this hot mashed potato. So again, you're getting flavor, it's caramelized, and it's a nice little treat when you get down there to the bottom of the potato. So I just want to do the extra so you can see that. This plate's getting kind of full over here, but we're going to slide that kind of in here. This is a full Thanksgiving Day dinner. Sliced white and dark meat, of dark meat from the leg. We have our potato that's called a Duchess potato. That is a sweet potato in the russet. And don't forget, we have over here the squash stuffed with stuffing. So you don't have to do a meat stuffing, you can do your bread stuffing here. Or not even do the squash, just just giving you some ideas here. So it's very colorful. You can eat that with your eyes all day long. <laughs> so yeah. making me full right now, looking at it. So now our second plate that we have, this is our spiral that we have. We did the stuffed rolled breast. What I have for potato for that one, I'm going to hold it up with my hands. It's not going to eat it anyways. What I have here, how many eat all gratin potatoes or scallop potatoes? I'm going to give you the most simplest recipe what you do for these. You have to have some type of machine at home to slice very thin potatoes. Wash your potatoes, peel them. Get two dishes out, one for sweet potatoes, like cereal bowls or some type of deep container that you can have. Pour heavy cream into two of those dishes. As you slice the potato directly into that cream, the starch from the potato and that heavy cream is what glues these together. 
So what I had, I did kind of, I usually do potatoes, sweet potato, every other roll. I kind of did it so you can see it because I don't know how far back the crowd would be tonight. And in between here, I have candied ginger, fresh thyme, and salt and pepper. So like every couple layers, a little bit of salt, a little bit of pepper, and that. And what you do then is you layer these into either a pie pan, casserole, something with a little depth to it. Because if you count these, there's probably 50 or more potatoes, like, you know, rope or layers in here, I should say. So it takes quite a bit. And what's really nice, but you can almost see the concentric circles of my sliced potatoes that I have on there, okay? What's really great about this potato is you make this three days ahead. It's really nice to do. So if you're really, you know, cranking out this dinner by yourself, this is a great potato to do. So what I do is after, you, uh, by the way, I also line my dish with either plastic wrap, and believe it or not, it goes with plastic wrap. Double thickness, put it in, this pops right up. This is called a pave, which means a paving work in French. And so what you do with these, then you bake that till it's tender. You have to check them in. It bakes quite a while. It could be an hour and a half, two hours, depending on your oven. Yes? They never turn brown? No. They're all covered up, but they turn very nice. What I've done with this now, that after it's cold, and remember, so you can make it three days ahead, you can pop this right out of that dish, take cookie cutters or a knife, cut them in any shape you want to, triangles, squares. You see here I used a brown biscuit cutter. Then I take and I brown it. See, this side's not brown. Let's see how I did it. I brown that just for, again, reading your eyes. So we get that caramelization right and flavor to it. Okay? So then this is our potato. So now we've combined the sweet potato again with the rest of the potato. Just another way for a nice presentation. Next thing we have is we need to have a vegetable with that one. So again, I'm using the summer squash, the blanched green beans, and the carrots. And another thing for eye appeal is to try to come up with different cuts of vegetables and things. So that gives us eye appeal right away. Is just doing some different little cuts. Later on, when you come up to the table and you look at the vegetable on the turkey leg plate there, I've done um, what's called a broom wah, which is a very, very small dice. It's like little tiny cubes. It's just that little bit of interest. And you don't need to make a lot, just a few, to give a little interest into your vegetables. So what I'm going to do is I have the mixture of these that you see here. I have the to give a little interest into your vegetables. So what I'm going to do is I have the mixture of these that you see here. I have these long garlic chives out of my garden. And you blanch these. And what you do is just boil a little water on the stove, kind of dip them back and forth with the tongs, take them out into ice water. And now this is going to be a tie. We're going to tie around vegetables. It's really pretty. Uh, the thing is to do is to get a little creative with your vegetables. Things like maybe some sautéed jicama. Something your family might not know, but give a little crunch, a little interest into the food instead of the same old, same old. So, what I usually do, especially this guy's so nice and long, is I'll probably pick up the bunch, kind of wrap around it, and get a good tie. Now, these have been blanched. That means, again, in that boiling water. And you can make these ahead of time. Have them nice and blanched and cold. And then you can just heat these up again before you need them. So we're just going to take that tie. Oh, this is a nice long one here. <laughs> you wouldn't need one that long. Uh, leek leaves work really well. Make sure you blanch those also. This one's so good, we could probably macrame it. <laughs> Bring back the seven. But yeah, you could tie it with this one. <laughs> so this is what you do is you blanch your vegetables. And then you can make these little bundles like this that's for your vegetable. You can make this a lot bigger. You can line them up, get them all to size. And then your vegetable would be done. All you would need to do is drizzle maybe a little lemon butter on that and then heat that up to serving temperature for your meal. But this looks gorgeous on a plate. So that brings a lot of interest and a lot of color. Okay. The other thing for this plate here, rather than throw this big bunch of green leaves on it or something, it's just some finely chopped parsley. And just give that a little sprinkle just to kind of wake that plate up. So I'm not going to be Emerald where he yells bam across the <laughs> My students, I tell them they get an F if they do that. <laughs> Threat. Not really. So this is entree number two. How's that so far? 
All right. Okay, we have done large vessels of vegetables that we can do. We did an appetizer and soup combination. We've also done an appetizer salad combination. You could put this little shooter right along with this salad. Now they get a little soup salad and appetizer. So that can be done. We have the larger eater here. We have a variety of everything that we made for Thanksgiving on that plate. And then we also have then the stuffed breast, maybe something a little different to do there. And that's actually very easy to do. It takes a little work, but not bad. And that makes another type of entree to have rather than just slice turkey on a plate. So now I think we need to go to dessert. Mm. <laughs> Nobody likes dessert. <laughs> All right. The dessert this evening, what we're going to have is I like dessert, but usually when I eat Thanksgiving, then you're so full. We did all that baking. Now we're going to downsize. We're going to make little minis instead of making great big large things. So for making mini desserts, which I always think about the labor involved with those, you can make your tart shells, freeze them, bring them out when you need them, and then you have that hard part done. The pumpkin filling, I have the cornstarch on my hands for the gloves. The pumpkin ones here, were baked um, crustless in a casserole. So then you can bake your filling and then just scoop it as you need it. That's kind of a neat thing. And I cheated here, these are out of the can, the cherries. Make it a little simpler on yourself. This is a apple that has been sauteed in butter with a little bit of orange zest and a little bit of caramel touched in there. So I'm thinking like a caramel apple. So that's another neat way to do it. Um, also, in your dessert section, I gave you two sauce recipes. Let's see, we're getting into this part. I gave you the tart recipe. I gave you my favorite sweet potato pie recipe, and that's what I used, but I used pumpkin tonight. Also, instead of cognac, which is my favorite sweet potato, I used Grand Marnier and the pumpkin one. So you can play a little bit with flavor, not just with your eyes. It's, get some of those little liqueurs in there. You don't have to go out and buy a $50 bottle, you can just go buy a little tiny things at the liquor store to, to jazz up your desserts. So we have the tart pastry, we have different fillings. I have, still have one little one here for you. In the sauces that I gave you, I call, gave you something called chocolate ganache. It's basically heavy cream and chocolate. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. But what I've added to that also is I pureed some figs into that. So now I have chocolate ganache and fig. So this is a little sophisticated tart here. A little different maybe than your family I don't know if you'll like or not, but it's something to, to go with. So what we're going to do for dressing up our plate, I made you a little chocolate paint. Hopefully it's warm enough that we can use it. This is chocolate ganache. That's all that is that I have in here. Okay. And I take a pastry brush. Oh, it's too hard, ladies. It's probably not going to paint. Not soft enough yet. Okay. What we're going to do is we're just going to give a little swish on the plate, and this is so easy, I'm sure you don't have pastry brushes at home, and you don't think about it, you just go, whoa, I've got chocolate on my plate. It's a little hard. I'll go back and do it again. But you don't think about how you're painting on it. It's going to be a little willy-nilly, no thought to it, because otherwise you start thinking about it, and then you stop, and then it looks like, all right, who messed up my plate? Kind of like what Katie did right here. But you do, you just want to give a little swish. That's all you want to do with the chocolate. And the reason for doing a swish like this, or you can put it in, if you noticed, I used just a cheap squirt bottle that you could use for your sauces. Same thing with leftover honey bottles and stuff. The students made a caramel sauce, and there was just a little honey left in the bottle. I said, okay, now I got honey caramel. Mm -hmm. So the little squirt bottles is a great way to um, garnish also on the plate. So we have the honey caramel, and again, you don't want to think too much about it. You just want to kind of give it a little swirl on the plate because your tarts are going to go on top of that and kind of cover that up a little bit. So, like I said, you get two full eaten turkey dinner. I still want my dessert. So we're going to now give us a little sample of what we have for desserts. And I'm sure after Thanksgiving we could get by with eating those three. I know they're making me hungry. So we'll just do three tonight. Usually, think of I. No one's eating that one. Good see. When you think of doing desserts, so think of if I don't know if anybody knows anything about flower arranging, but you always think of odd numbers. 
It always looks more aesthetic to the eye. So if you notice the meat today, I cut it in three slices. You know, the vegetables, you want to make an odd number also. The police aren't going to command you if it's not. <laughs> but really, odd numbers looks better than the eye meat, of course. One thing we're missing now is I think we need some whipped cream on this. Now tonight, I don't have a whipped cream. I have a whipped topping. It's not cool, but it's one that we use in the restaurant business. And I also added a little gelatin in it because I wasn't sure how hot it would be in the room, so I kind of stabilized it with a little bit of um, stabilized it with a little bit of gelatin so that it would stay for us in the room. And you don't have to have a pastry bag or anything like that. If everybody watches me, it's going to look three-sided. It's going to look like a football. We call these quenelles. And what I like about quenelles is you can kind of stand them up for presentation. I think the pumpkin needs to cover up where I broke that crust. <laughs> so we're going to kind of get a couple of quenelles to lean up there for us. I scoop it up. I kind of rub it from one spoon to the next. You see the sides? And just do it like that. And that's all you got to do. Stand up a little bit there. All right. So now we have a little whipped cream. Simple. By the way, this has a amaretto in it too. <laughs> so in case you can't drink, it's in there. What's that? <laughs> this is what makes the happy chef. <laughs> a little, I, I don't know if anybody remembers a galloping gourmet. I used to love him when he drank. He doesn't drink anymore. <laughs> it's always fun. All right, I have a little bit of this apple tart that's on here too. A um, little bit of whipped cream on top for that one. A little bit of the honey caramel. And then how about some of those candy pecans I had earlier? Mm. Sound good? Mm. Now we got a caramel apple, don't we? That's another thing you can do. So think of your favorite little things, whatever you want to do. These, by the way, were candied with a little bit of sugar and there's a little bit of cinnamon. And the recipe that I gave you for sugared pecans is one that I use a lot in baking. I take an egg white and I beat it till it's nice and frothy. And then I mix that on my pecans. And then a little bit of granulated sugar, I kind of sift over that and then I bake that in an oven and, they, and I just let them stay in the oven until they toast and they get caramelized. They get kind of like a white coating on them. It's kind of sugary, but they're really good to use in desserts or in salads or things like that. They kind of be real sugary, but they get nice and crunchy. So, here's our lovely tarts. I'll finish those up when it comes time for tasting. And here's one of our ideas for desserts here. I think we could eat this after all these courses. So there's our Thanksgiving dinner. Hope you enjoyed that and any of the ideas that I can give you. And then I'll take questions. Painted on the plate. Painted on the plate. Is that the texture that you said that you added the dates to and used as a fill? Oh, um, this one that's in here is a bit of a milk chocolate with this one. This one's a little different. Okay. It's not the same chocolate that I have right here. Okay. This, the one that I have here is a ambrosia chocolate chip. Oh. Okay. And heavy cream is added into this one. Do you see how this one looks kind of glassy? Mm -hmm. well, the students made this. I always tell them if you want them to keep it really shiny, Add a little drop of light carol syrup to it. So, or you can finish with a little bit of butter. The only thing when you add butter, when butter gets cold, it gets hard. Yeah. So you can kind of watch that. And if you want to thin this out like it's too thick, see this look, almost looks like fudge? Mm -hmm. Just heat up a little more cream a little bit and add it to it and get it to the consistency that you want. And to test it, put a little drop on a plate and put it in your refrigerator. So if it sets up, then you need to take it with a little more cream into it. So it's just a little. Chocolate's kind of temperamental, you have to play with it a little bit. So put a little more heavy cream into it. And because that's what this one is just right now. So once you get more the cream, does it maintain that creaminess thing? Yes, it does. So that's what you're trying to get that. Yeah. Because you want that nice, creamy, smooth chocolate. Love for chocolate. I don't really actually like chocolate, but I like it for the other guys. <laughs> so I'm just interested in that rolled turkey breast. And doing that turkey breast? Yeah, but I don't I'd be afraid. 
it's really simple. We can go through that again, but yeah. let me take this other lady's question real quick and then we'll do that. It's about hard boiled eggs. To make the deviled eggs, I once had to make like 90 of them. And, um, Did you have green eggs? <laughs> well, it, it's about the eggs. I had them, they were extremely fresh, and I could hardly get the shell off. And I thought, would, would it be because they were fresh? No, no, honestly. What you do is you put your eggs in your cold water, bring them up to a boil, uh -huh. boil them for five minutes. Then you take them off the heat and let them sit for 10 covered. Then you flush them with ice cold water. That's the trick. So, okay. I do, sometimes I'll like, oh, but I didn't follow my own rule. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you put your cold eggs in cold water. And the reason you do that is because you don't want to shock them. Yeah, okay. okay. You bring them up to a boil and you gently boil them. Don't go crazy, otherwise you'll crack it and be all over in that pan. Boil them for five minutes. Turn it off. Put a cover on it, even for 10. So do you leave right on that one? No, I take mine off. I have an electric then. stove at home, oh, so I okay. have to take mine yeah. off. And okay. that's the way my, gr the way I did it when my grandma taught me was bring it to a boil in the cold water like that. Then after it comes to a boil, put the lid on, take it off the burner, and let it sit for 25. Well, she's kind of doing the residual heat that's in there. Yeah. But sometimes then you might get your yolk is done because it's a dot, right? Okay. Quite so that's why you boil it for five and then let it Take sit it for off, ten. Cover it, and, cover it, it ten. and then ice cold water. Yeah, we're talking cold. I let the cold water run. I'll take an ice tray and pour it on. Oh. School, we oh. take a big scoop in the same thing. Oh. Okay. I'll give you another little trick. I take the egg and I kind of crack and roll it on the side of the sink or something. Yeah. So that I'm like crackling all that shell. Yeah. And then when it's wet, it's, that water kind of breaks that barrier in there. Oh. Okay. Good luck. I do. I hope you have luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to. I'm not trying I'm to steer you wrong. Give it a try. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. How long do you let it set in cold water? Till they're ice cold. Till like when I pick the egg up and I feel oh. it's really cold, then I can go to the So what do you add to your deviled eggs? I actually, I made these pretty mild for me. My favorite thing is curry. Oh. I, oh. I can't make a deviled egg without curry. Oh. So curry and peppers. My friend over here, she loves peppers, so I do. I'm kind of on the hot side. But I think they're devilish. They should be that. Yeah. <laughs> and I, the reason I like curry is I love the smell and the flavor. It also makes it beautiful yellow. So it looks really pretty. Like these were made with a Dijon mustard at school, and they're kind of, they taste like Dijon mustard to me. Uh -huh. so, any other questions? We have 15 minutes to eat. She wanted to go over the roll of turkey. Oh, that's over the rolled turkey breast for you again, okay? Yeah. Have my whole turkey. I take a very sharp boning knife for the sharpest knife. Do they have the butcher to do that? I don't know. Do we have any butchers <coughs> around here that do that nice stuff for us anymore? Lopez, I suggest. Lopez, Mike? Yes. yes. Yeah. Actually, you know, for you too, you know you can go and buy just a turkey breast. But I don't know if they're boneless. You're still going to end up doing that procedure I'm going to talk about. Right get now. Them, uh, what do you think? Do you know the bone that goes over the top? That's called the keel yeah. bone. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you take that turkey's defrosted, when you go and take that sharp knife and you go against that bone, believe it or not, very you can almost do it with your hands. You take that knife blade and you just kind of run it a little bit, and it just kind of moves away from that keel bone, and you get that whole lobe then off of there. Now remember, there's going to be a turkey tender that runs. It kind of looks like a loose piece of meat on top, and that's what I have here tonight. Is that turkey tender that I? cut and slice for you on that one plate. So you take that out, because it's going to fall off anyway, you got to get rid of it. So that would be a great snack for you tonight when you're home all alone. <laughs> you get the best part for you. Okay, so now we have this lobe. Think of it a turkey breast. It's flat here, and it's got that rounded edge. I mean, if you see a chicken breast, you see yeah. that. Okay. So you're going to look at it, and it's going to be like heavy here, and it kind of tapers down. Okay. You're going to take a knife in that thicker part, and put your hand on top of it on the counter like this. And you're going to very carefully take and cut, and you're opening that up so that you open that breast and cut it butterfly. You don't cut. you don't cut all the way through. You keep it attached. And for the first time out, give yourself a little extra in there. So now I take a piece of saran wrap or plastic wrap. I can't push that company. Put that chick or turkey breast down. We want the rough side up. You remember that smooth side I talked about? Mm -hmm. Keep that down, the rough side up. I put another piece of plastic wrap on there. Then you go get your best wine bottle. 
and then you smack that little baby. A meat mallet, wine bottle, mm -hmm. or actually, these skillets are a little light. But if you had a really good heavy skillet, you're going to pound on that turkey breast. And when you pound, do this. So that what you're doing is you're taking that meat out. Yep, so what you're going to do is you're going to take this piece of meat that's this size, you're going to make it into a nice rectangle. So that's a solid piece of nice white meat. When I'm doing that turkey, before I cut that turkey breast, I take and I get that skin off. I go around the leg, the wing, and I get this big sheet of skin. You flip that turkey over, you've got a second big sheet of skin you can use. And I go and I trim fat or anything I don't like the looks of, I take that off. Because if you use too much fat, then it's kind of rubbery. I don't know if you can see here this line. You can come up and look at it later. There's a line here, and that's actually not very tasty to be eating. I left it on so that it would stay moist. So that's what I do. So you can remove the skin. Does that help you with from that turkey? You're just going to have to get into that. <laughs> Go buy yourself a turkey and get playing. I have to tell you, though, a Cornish hen, a chicken, a duck, a pheasant, a turkey, they're all built the same. So start out with either something smaller or whatever, and give it a try. Yeah, that's your practice one. I suggest bigger than a Cornish hen. You might get a little frustrated with that. Please don't go to a quail. <laughs> You yes. mentioned about the turkey leg to get the tendons off. How did you do that? Again? Okay, what I did, I don't have a paring knife here to make a big spicy knife. No. I go around with a sharp knife when this is raw. When it's raw. When it's raw. And I just take it and I go around here and roll that and cut and cut and cut and cut. Until, because you're going to see it, there's little tendons in here. So you're going to cut those. So then I put this in the oven when I'm roasting it. This shrinks down. This one shrinks this way. And that little knob that's on the end, the grisly part, that'll just fall right off when you're done because you've loosened it here. Then when it's hot, I just take, now I, I use a needle nose in the kitchen. It's got nothing to do with my toolbox. It's only for my kitchen toolbox. And that's what I hang on to the meat and I pull those tendons and they come right out of there when that's hot. So that you have just this nice ball of meat. I took about eight tendons off this, and I'm going to look and see when I go home to see if there's any more in there. But anyways, you know, that's how you get the tendons off. It's a little nicer if you ask me, because I feel sorry for people to get this. They go, oh, I want the leg, and then yeah, you yeah. see them fighting with that all yeah. over their plate. So this is kind of a nice idea to do that. Very good idea. Is there any other questions? Yes. Then with topping, you add gelatin to the thing it up. Yeah, what I did is so that um, a lot of times, we call it a stabilizer, when we want to stabilize the whipped cream. So this is just topping, but um, when I'm making real whipped cream, this is a liquid topping that it gets treated just like heavy cream. So you put it in your chilled bowl, you start to mix it, but before all that begins, I take a teaspoon of unflavored gelatin, and I mix it with a couple tablespoons of cold water, and I let it sit there for like five minutes. We call that raining it in letting it reabsorb into the gelatin. And then I take that and I can just melt that in a little pan or in the microwave or whatever to bring it back to liquid. So when I go to whip my whipped cream or topping, I get it to where it's kind of what we call a soft peak, not even before that. It's just starting to get thick. Mm -hmm. I stop the machine. I know some of you probably have hand mixers. I have a stand one. So I have to stop my machine. I pour that little bit of gelatin in the middle and then I right away get that back up and start whipping it again. <coughs> so that gelatin will keep whipped cream nice and stiff like this for three days. <coughs> if you want to frost a cake yeah. with whipped cream, this is the way to do it. Do you put um, like Yep. With this cheap topping, that's why I put the amaretto in there. Mm -hmm. so it gives it a little flavor. If you put, if you like almonds, put a drop of almond in, put a little vanilla in there, a little confectioner sugar in there, you know, sweeten it. So that works really Would great. I have a frosting one on bakery cakes that's really good. It's not. You think you like the cakery? It's yeah. called Better Cream. That stuff is. Yep. And it's made by the same company that made this. This is Rich's Whip. Mm -hmm. But this is a liquid. You can buy it at Pick and Save, Woodman's, and all over the place. So. Or you bake as it. But the frosting you're talking about is called Better Cream. Okay, thanks. So. How much water did you add to the teaspoon? Um, oh, I just added, I add enough to that it can be made into a liquid. Oh. So, you know, for this, like if I add a teaspoon, yeah, a couple tablespoons or something. You could actually take the cold cream itself and mix it with the gelatin and then oh. remelt that later on. But water works just as good too. So. 
Just remember, one tablespoon of unflavored gelatin will gel a quart of liquid like jello. So don't get generous or you're not going to be able to. They'll go, thank you for the rubber ball. Yeah. Teaspoon. Teaspoon. That's what was added in this was a teaspoon and this makes a pint. Oh. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Well, I want to thank you for having me here this evening and I hope we kind of get you excited for Thanksgiving or holiday dinners. And uh, let's eat.